Hit record. Awesome, thank you. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Maggie Hughes and I will be moderating uh, this panel, panel two of Monsters and Men, Dehumanization and the Taboo of the Inhuman. Um, so our first presenter on this panel is Gianpaolo Moesina. Uh, Gianpaolo is a PhD student in Italian at UW-Madison. He earned his BA in Italian language and culture from Università di Pisa and his MA in didactics of Italian literature from Università per Stranieri di Siena. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> um, as lecturer, he taught comparative literature and cinema courses at the Universidad del Pacifico in Lima, Peru, and worked as didactic coordinator of the Italian language courses at the Italian Cultural Institute of Lima. His research interests include comparative literature, critical and theoretical intersections between literature, cinema, and philosophy, post-war Italian political science, uh, political cinema and literature, and experimental cinematic and literary works of the 20th century. And throughout the panels today, please feel free to put any questions you have for our presenters in the chat and we will address them at the end. Go ahead, Gianpaolo. Okay, thank you so much. Let me share my PowerPoint. Okay, I hope you can see it. Okay, so hello everybody. And uh, I should say that before starting, uh, I was reading the titles of the papers that we will present in this panel. And I read uh, the humanization, perversion, obscene, disgusting, and again perversion. And it is just 9 a.m. in the morning. So I apologize, please forgive me. But let's go back to, to my paper. And uh, the purpose of this work is the valorization and the interpretation of the biblical drama film written and directed by Pierpaolo Pasolini in 1964, Il Vangelo Secondo Matteo, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, in relation to its poetical expression of a tragic universe, in its criticism towards the perversion of modernity, with examples taken from the cultural tradition. The main idea that I present uh, according to the proposal formulated by Pasolini himself is the possibility of developing by following the projection of significant images and their reception by the audience, a dialogue and a meditation on the tragedy of contemporary Western man, the transmutation of his human condition into a mechanical artifice, the loss of his sacred dimension as a creative subjectivity of his nature and responsible of his existence. From the viewpoint uh, of the formal setting, the poetical tragical view of Pasolini is born from the interest directed towards uh, the experimentation of the expressive possibilities which the cinematic medium offered as a uh, lingua scritta dell'azione dell'uomo nella realtà. A semiotic framework which distanced itself from the narrative settings of the industry of the time and which instead drew near to the poetical expression of the primitive cinematic image. Wanting to manifest his refusal toward naturalism and to show that it is impossible to recreate reality in an absolute manner before the audience's eyes, Pasolini adopted a sort of technical distancing from the cinematographic artifice, recreating visual signs in a never ending motion, similar to reality. Later, he will assign a precise meaning and rhythm through the editing that follows the filming. A creative process, the latter one, which is delivered as a primary result, its characteristic cinema di poesia, the cinema of poetry, theorized in the famous and homonymous essay containing Empirismo Eretico. So having in mind the objective to reestablish in man his lost sacredness and to recuperate his distinctive cultural identity, Pasolini evoked the literary and spiritual sources of the Western tradition in the aesthetic experience of his own ch cinema di poesia, his own cinema of poetry. And by doing so, he tried to rediscover the universal anthropological structure under the influence of the rationalist Marxist model, uh, fundamentally inspired by the work of Gramsci, and under the influence of the Freudian psychoanalysis. Nevertheless, 
in front of the prevalence of a, a functionalist conception of reason, which uh, uh, reproduces the dynamics of domination belonging to the capitalist productive system, a thesis that was also sustained by the members of the Frankfurt School, uh, Orkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse, above all, Pasolini decided to lay out his motivations through the world of irrationality, through the creative possibilities of Orpheus, and uh, in this specific case, by using the expressive power of the Judeo-Christian tradition, sacred myth. But why Matthew? So according to Pasolini, the gospel is a historic narration which belongs to the spiritual and literary inheritance of Western popular culture. Nevertheless, in a society like the Italian one, it seemed to belong exclusively to the institution of the Catholic Church. Even if he personally felt uh, uh, a predilection for the gospel narrated by John, because of the particular metaphysical background that seems to envelop it entirely, Pasolini chose the text of Matthew for its unquestionable poetical depth. And because he had been the most uh, worldly, the most mundane of the four evangelists, the one closer to the real problems of his historical age, the one who considered the worldly domain above the solely theological preaching. Furthermore, the Christ of Matthew perfectly reflects the contradiction of man, because uh, if uh, on one hand uh, he announces the ethical value implicit in the commandment, thou shalt not kill, on the other hand, he manifests as his most barbarous antithetical expression, arising as the bearer of the sword. Non pensate che io sia venuto a portare pace sulla terra. Non sono venuto a portare una pace, ma una spada. So he is the most revolutionary Christ since he asks the young rich man to abandon his fortune and follow him because he proclaims the equality between lords and vassals and rebels against the constitute order. He is the Christ who doesn't react and talks softly to the people, a characteristic which according to Pasolini belongs mainly to the bourgeois. In addition, the speech of Matthew had a moral beauty which wholly coincided with Pasolini's own. So starting from the literary crisis, which in those years the Italian culture was uh, experiencing, a decadence caused mainly by, always according to Pasolini, by the loss of certain aesthetic codes or criteria, beauty uh, could no longer be recognized as an aesthetic fact, but maybe only as a pure moral fact. For this reason, and because it was impossible to film in the natural scenery of Palestine or Israel, due mainly to the modernization of the surrounding landscapes, Pasolini chose to recreate the text of Matthew by, by analogy, filming it in the center of Southern Italy, and in particular the Lazio, Basilicata, Puglia, Calabria, and uh, Sicily. So these places still preserve some liking to the ancient world, able to show as well, images of the pre-industrial peasants' environment, almost prehistoric, from where originated the larger part of the Lampen proletariat who lived in the Roman suburbs, so important for Pasolini. So without renouncing his uh, Marxist ideology, Pasolini knew how to translate clearly the social message of Matthew's gospel, the love uh, for the poor and the oppressed, without excluding the sacred dimension of Christ. In what concerned the critical attitude towards modernity, uh, Pasolini's Christ is a, a tragic hero whose light affirms the freedom of man beyond any other obscure form of uh, uh, development that tries to dominate him, alienate him, or even commodify him. He will betray it, the Christ of Pasolini as Ettore in Mamma Roma, taking with him, like Oreste in Appunti per un'Orestia di Africana, a sort of hereditary blame, the sin of a whole bloodline. Therefore, he is a sinner without a sin of his own. And uh, like Oedipus, he will have to redeem it through a very painful sacrifice, to die crucified. In this specific case, Pasolini proposed to examine his own historical spiritual conscience, and I mean individual and collective conscience, 
uh, to stand against the emptiness, the perversion and the anthropological uniformity of the modern industrial society and against the changes in the popular culture. In this research, Pasolini identified the universal man with the poetical image of the myth of Christ, a symbolic expression whose expressive strength exalted its own mystery and made visible the realities which determine life. So loyal to the narration of Matthew, uh, Pasolini recreates these figures as a sort of symbolic presence whose singular action traces the fundamental signs of the tragical universe. In essence, the Christ recreated uh, by Pasolini is a subjectivity alien to the tragic blame uh, which is ascribed to him. And uh, in his own loneliness, he is afraid, as every man is, afraid of the proximity of death. The extreme suffering he experiences becomes part of his own action. And uh, as aesthetical value, moreover, he's a poetical image which expresses liberation and autonomy from an existential will that, uh, similar to Sartre existentialism, embraces the world of humanity and is always about to become manifest within the limit of the Pasolinian tragical conscience. So following Freud's thesis, and as I said, embracing the Frankfurtian critical line, even if we cannot affirm that with the, with the latter one, there is a direct link. The logic of Orpheus of Pasolini reflects the impulse to life and the impulse of death through epical heroism. This bond, present in his literary work as well as in, uh, in his uh, cinematic work, promoted in turn the manifestation of his tragical conscience, a hereditary form of intuitive knowledge the coming together of reason and sensibility that in his poetics is represented by the, the metaphor of the disperata vitalità, the desperate vitality, which is to say by the expression of his particular existential distress and joy. A reflection, the latter, of the double drama that he lived as a man in a continuous and complex existential dilemma and as a poet in the creative problematic that concerned the limits of the portrayal of reality. Uh, we can sense that the specular experience of the gospel of Pasolini may constitute also a sort of personal catharsis, a poetic exercise of self-liberation and self-comprehension, where the poet filmmaker showed the interpretative keys of his personality by confronting humanity and the tragic destiny of myth with his own personal exist existential conflict. For example, identifying the passion with his ideology, the innocence, the loneliness, and the diversity of the tragic hero with the ingenuity, the margination, and the conflict that he himself experienced. In the cinematic view of Pasolini, philosophical and poetical desires merged to give an aesthetic expression to a singular form of knowledge, the tragic conscience. So attracted by the fusion between the Western cultural universe and the idea of destiny, Pasolini recreated a part of his own historical essence to show the survival of some distinctive and fundamental signs that lie in the universal collective unconscious. In this sense, uh, the Gospel of Pasolini was the first work in which he affirmed his nostalgia for the sacred, the mythical and the epic dimension. But uh, first and foremost, it was the poetical creation of an artist, not only a work of uh, religious inspiration, but a creation in which he adopted the sacred myth of the Judeo-Christian tradition with the aim to manifest a profound anthropological disquietude in a sort of poetical exercise of self comparison where the filmmaker analyzes his own self. He compares humanity and the tragic destiny of Christ with his own existential conflict. In conclusion, as a, a critical expression against modernity, against the perversion of modernity, the Pasolinian Christ is therefore a crystalline tragic hero, a hero whose excellency lies in his being capable of not losing conscience of his own destiny, to take to the extreme uh, his possibilities and uh, in the conscious acceptance 
of his very own sacrifice. He is free and dynamic will, guided by an internal spiritual debate that goes into an intellectual conflict with other active powers that want to, uh, to prevail over him, to pervert him. The light that this symbolic figure emanates, thanks to the representation that Pierpaolo Pasolini created, affirms and reiterates after many years, and even, even in, this, uh, in this pervert, obscene and inhuman times, the potentiality of freedom, of greatness, and uh, of dignity of man. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Giampaolo. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, now we will pass to uh, Sergio Chargel. Uh, Sergio is a master's candidate in contemporary literature and culture, um, a master's candidate in political science with a bachelor's in social communication, journalism, and social, commu and social communication, advertising, and marketing. Um, so with that, I will pass it to Sergio. Hello. Thank you, Maggie. Um, well, my bio is a bit outdated, actually. Now I'm a PhD candidate in, in literature and political science. But uh, uh, I will talk uh, about uh, the process of dehumanization of an intellectual that was very famous in Brazil in the beginning of the 20th century. But nowadays, it was uh, forgotten. And uh, I will try to share my screen, uh, even though I will sh show some images, some archive images, even though it's uh, in Portuguese, I think it's uh, important to illustrate the case. Please tell me if you can see it. Yes, thank you. Just one second. Okay. Well, um, this is the beginning of my research in the PhD. So I'm sorry, I apologize if it's not complete. Uh, I researched the narrative disputes that were created around Silvia Serafim Tibau, writer and journalist, one of the first Brazilian feminists, um, also the murder of Roberto Rodriguez, Nelson Rodriguez's brother. Nelson was one of the most famous Brazilian playwrights, perhaps the most famous. As I speak, I will pass some slides that to illustrate the story, as I said, uh, even though they are in Portuguese, uh, as you can see, uh, I will try to explain their meanings, and I believe the, the images and uh, help to understand. Being short, as short as possible, the canonical version of the murder states that Silva Serafim Tibau, poet and journalist, daughter of an Osvaldo Cruz assassin, Osvaldo Cruz being a famous Brazilian sanitarist, frequent in high society in Rio, invaded the office of the Rodriguez newspaper, The Critic, and murdered Roberto Rodriguez with a shot in his belly. With Roberto's illustration, the front page story of the same day featured an image of Silva being caressed, suggesting adultery with the call, as you can see, today a rumorous request for divorce comes into court in this capital. There is a great anxiety about knowing the reasons for the separation of the Tibau couple. Silva had gotten a friendly divorce. Irritated by the exposure of her private life, even after the newspaper promised that would not publish it, she invaded the newsroom with the intention of killing Mario Rodriguez, owner of the newspaper. As he wasn't there, he was replaced by his son. Mario Rodriguez would die two months after uh, by cerebral thrombosis, according to Rui Castro, as a consequence of the depression caused by the loss of his son. A young Nelson Rodriguez was in the newsroom and witnessed the murder of his brother, a trauma that would mark him through his life, as he says, and I quote, my tutor would not be the same, nor would I be as I am, if I had not suffered in the flesh and in the soul, if I had not cried until the last year of passion, the murder of Roberto. Tiba was caught in flagrant and tried in a great media show, the first trial to be broadcast in radio in Brazil. Now, the story of the murder of Roberto Rodriguez has received several versions, from the pornographic angel and Nelson's biographic book by Hugh Castro, an episode of Linha Direta, if one translates something like Direct Line, a popular television show, 
And even fiction novels such as Sylvia Cannot Dance, in which Sylvia's own life is fictionalized and purposely distorted. Some exaggerating some details, uh, distort some points, modify pieces. They are heterogeneous versions of a particular fragment, but they all reveal the same mannequin and one-sided trait, the need for a villain. Sometimes the villains are the Rodriguez, often is Sylvia. All the narratives have shown to this day, incapable of deepening the character of Sylvian, invariable interpreted in a simplistic way. Her production as a writer and journalist were forgotten, erased, only the collective memory of her crime remained. Now the humanization's narratives on Sylvia begins shortly after the murder and continues to this day. The embryo of this division is a political dispute. Sylvia's trial was a kind of stage personification for a struggle between feminists and progressives on one hand and conservative and reactionaries on the other. The first group argued that the defendant had her private life exposed, her honor offended, and attacked as for being a divorced feminist woman. While the other group argued that Sylvia had offended Brazilian mothers, destroyed a family and mother, and I quote, an artist of 23 years of age head of the family deeply honest with the brilliance of the great talents and unbeatable virtues. As it appeared in the note Lincoln Daily in the newspaper, one of the headlines in the critic, as you can see, uh, stated that civil defense by progressive groups was, uh, and I quote, a no trade to the Brazilian family. The friends of murder Silvia Seraphine tried to match her with the virtuous ladies of our society. The Brazilian traditional family ranks far above all these indignities. Max Gomes Paiva changing, uh, sorry, Max Gomes Paiva, Max Gomes Paiva, prosecuting attorney at the trial, personified this argument by stating that the defendant changed her condition as an angel of the home for the profession of journalist, for the satisfaction of her vanity. In short, it was as if Sylvia's crime was not the murder itself but the obscenity of daring to defend female independence in 1930. Behind the political and ideological split, a media battle ensued between the Associated Diaries by uh, Chateaubriand, C. Chateaubriand, Brazilian biggest media magnate, to which by that time Silvio was a collaborator, and the critic and the Rodriguez family's allies, which adds a whole new layer to their narratives. Now taken as a, scope, a scapegoat, uh, at the heart of this political ideological dispute, Sylvia underwent a process of dehumanization, interpreted uh, in a Manichaean way by both sides, sometimes sacralizing, sometimes often actually demonizing. A dehumanization whose inheritance is still preserved today, considering the difficulty of finding her literary and journalistic work, although her crime is still very present in the collective memory and in popular culture. For example, in a, in a simple survey in Google with some keywords, about 30 academic papers were found, including theses, dissertations, articles, and essays. All of them, however, reproducing, reproduce the canonical versions, mainly from Rui Castro uh, biographic book, uh, and limit themselves to repeat the details of the murder and its impact on the Rodriguez family or Nelson None of these works delves into the character of Sylvia Sheriffing I was really limited only to her role as a murderer. It, now, it is, it, it is pertinent to assume that there was a gender relationship with this dehumanization, as well as a political relationship. After all, Sylvia claimed to be feminist and socialist. She wrote for the journal, uh, just a parenthesis, that was the name of the newspaper, the journal. Not very creative, I suppose. Uh, among other newspapers in the Associated Diaries chain by C. Chateaubriand, Aquero and Rival to Rodriguez as a former mentioned. She was even supported psychologically and financially by Chateaubriand through the process. One of his newspaper even published a headline saying, understandable attack, while the other published a provocative column by the journalist after the attack entitled, For the Right to Kill. The actuality of the several of her articles is noticeable. As an example, an article published in La Gazeta entitled Feminist, Silvia states that, and I quote, 
Under the general disapproval, the feminist is in the meantime the most true and noble woman. And another, the entitled The Female Intellectual Work, also published in Nagazeta, um, she argues that, and I quote, many female spirits exist for monotonous and homely existence. But what about the others? Those whose intellectual power is annihilated in the narrow and monotonous circle of domestic shores, such as an eagle in a canary's cage. It is necessary that in order to follow their destiny, they have to raise now happiness and that the satisf satisfaction of their intellectual personality is incompatible with the fulfillment of their sentimental experience. Nelson's biographic book, The Pornographic Angel, which is the main can the canonical book and which produced a growth in interest on the assassination following its publication in the early 90s, reinforced the image of Silva as an insane murderer, an image widely publicized by the Rodriguez newspaper after the murder. Every day, they link the notes saying, as you can see here, murderer's hooker. Today completes X days, signs uh, Silvia Terafin, ex Tibau, adulterous wife, infamous murder, infamous mother, sorry, whose vices inspired an outrageous divorce action for her to have greater freedom as a street prostitute, wounded to death, Roberto Rodriguez. The murderer's howlot will be punished. In another article from August 24, 1930, Number 557 of the critic, after the death of Romario Rodriguez, circulated a fake image created for an article by Mario Filho, one of his sons, shows uh, Silvia laughing with mockery next to Roberto Rodriguez's open coffin, reframing the dehumanization, the dehumanized image that paradox mixes insanity with coldness, spice of coffee with spicy causes. And just a parenthesis, like, um, Mario Rodriguez may be famous for giving the Stadium of Maracanã its name. Its name is Stadium of Mario Filho. Once again, Rui Castro corroborates this view by describing Roberto as a genius and an innocent artist. It is important to note that according to Castro, Roberto himself committed adultery openly, despite the repeated argument used by the newspaper and the acquisition attorney in the judgment that Silvia was a danger to the Brazilian family for supposedly being an adulteress, even though there were actually no evidences of it. Not only Roberto was sacralized, that also brought honor to Mario Rodriguez. And the edition of the critic on September 6, 1930, brought that Mario Rodriguez was, and I quote, the greatest journalist of all time, and the, that he was the renovator of the Rio de Janeiro press which lent all the brilliance of his penny and as a stylist and creator of beauty and fascination of his prodigious intelligence and culture. Furthermore, Castro practically grants supernatural powers to Silvia, stating that after, after Silvia's death, it was if after, even after her death, Silvia still had Geoffrey, another of Nelson's brother, fate in her hands and did not want to spare him. And the narratives of the, the pornographic angel do not do much differently. Silvia Cannot Dance collects the portrait made by Rui Castro and goes further, transforming into fiction and treating Silvia not only as crazy, but also as incestuous, besides creating an anachronist relationship between Silvia and Nelson. Linha Direta TV shows seeks to, seeks to a kind of redemption of Silvia's image, showing her simultaneously as a perpetration and victim of a tragedy of error. So a more close uh, portrait of what actually happened. As for the later, it is interesting to note that the video of the episode linked on YouTube brought the narrative disputes around the journalist to a new environment and a kind of hundred years later revival of the arguments used during the, her trial. A user says on the YouTube link, and I quote, an adulterous woman is the worst thing that exists. The proof was so strong that this little woman lived bitterly and took her own life, that the God or Lordy have takes care of the soul that of this boy who was murdered by her. Ignoring that the murderer itself, uh, himself was an adulterer. To which another user replies, go fuck yourself and Roberto Rodriguez. Is an adulterous woman the worst thing? What about an adulterous man and a slanderer? 
He got what he deserved. A third comment appears. In my opinion, she is innocent. She should have killed the whole family. Further, another continues. She was so mentally balanced that he, she killed herself. And there was still his, the grandson saying, I'm grandma was this and that. Your grandma was strionic and homicidal, dude. To which another one replies, and the family too. She, would, she should have murdered the entire family to learn. And he receives a final reply. This ramp there only entered history as a mad woman who did not like to hear the truth about her promiscuity exposed in the newspapers. Her ideals of freedom was to blow the doctor while she was married. What a revolutionary, huh? Discussions continue for a few pages of comments, illustration, uh, illustrating that the events uh, still mobilize disputes similar to those of 1913. Sylvie published articles in several newspapers of the time, especially those in the Associated Diaries chain, raising controversial issues for the time, such as female emancipation and works rights. Uh, it's due to remember that Brazil in 1930 was a very, still, but by, back then, was a very conservative country. She also traveled the whole country giving lectures on such things. However, even though she was regionally famous during her days, her political journalist and poetic works, she was also a poet, um, were forgotten, and she is only remembered by history as an obscene murder, an angel of vengeance for some, an obscene demon for others. But only with a complete and objective analysis of everything that was created around Sylvia, as well as everything as she created, uh, will it be possible to displace the image of monster or angel seraphim as her surnames allow the poem and reject the Manichaean and unilateral views of it, as well as analyze the multifacets of this character as an intellectual, as a feminist, as a socialist, as a burgess, as a murderer, and as a poet. Although all of this knowledge that complete, ob complete objective is, is impossible and that there is no neutral object of subject of its subject, only an archival uh, research will avoid manichaeism and not dehumanize neither Silvia nor the Rodriguez, but analyze them as complex figures and contradictory human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. That was wonderful. Uh, just one second. Sure. <laughs> I'm trying to, okay, found it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have uh, Nora. Uh, so Nora is a second year PhD student in Italian studies at Cornell University. She received her BA and MA in philosophy from the University of Pavia, Italia, and her BA and MA in human sciences from the University School for Advanced Studies, IUSS of Pavia, Italy. She's interested in the relationship between politics and aesthetics and works with mostly theoretical Italian and German texts. Her principal authors of reference are so-called uh, Italian thought, classical German aesthetic, Benjamin and Kafka. Thank so you. I will pass it to Nora Siena. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. So um, the general topic of my work is the biopolitical interpretation of 18th century German aesthetics, uh, in particular through the lenses of uh, Roberto Esposito's Immunitas. Uh, but my presentation today focuses uh, specifically on one aspect of this issue, namely the construction of the beautiful slash disgusting body as an immunological dispositive. Um, first, I want to clarify what I mean for an immunological dispositive giving a, uh, by giving a brief account of those points of Esposito's theory that are more useful for my thesis. So uh, through the trilogy Communitas, Immunitas, and Bios, um, Roberto Esposito develops his personal reading of Foucault's uh, biopolitics. And for biopolitics, I mean the interpretation of the modern and contemporary paradigm of power as a process of increasing politicization of life. And uh, Esposito's concept of immunitas modifies Foucault's idea of biopolitics, uh, um, mainly in terms of the relationship between bios and polis, life and the city, life and politics. Um, indeed, uh, Foucault, according to Esposito, failed to fully understand the ontological link between life and politics, considering these two terms as uh, originally separated. 
um, instead Esposito um, develop, he develops his notion of immunitas precisely on the basis of a strong idea of the ontological codependency between life and politics. Um, in the third chapter of Immunitas, in particular, Esposito shows that at the origin of uh, modern biopolitics lies a linguistic contamination between the domain of politics and that of uh, human physiology. Um, so Esposito not only observes that the analogy between the body natural and the body politics was for centuries uh, the most uh, uh, common figural topos um, to represent the functioning of the body political. Um, in particular, Esposito, um, uh, Esposito observes um, the fundamental and omnipresent character of the analogy between the body natural and the body politics, and he shows how inextricably, inextric inextricably um, the two terms of the analogy have influenced each other, um, giving an immunological character to the modern political uh, lexicon. Uh, analyzing centuries of medical and political treatises, Esposito displays that every epistemological shift in the conception of the body and its conditions corresponds to a readjustment of the idea of the state and its functions. Uh, vice versa, the pressures and anxieties experienced at the political level are mirrored in the medical conceptualization of diseases and find a sublimation in the development of therapies and medications. So Esposito's intuition is that biopolitics is the effect of the epistemological entanglement of politics and biomedical uh, knowledge. So the, the metaphor of the body for political science, as well as the paradigm of governmentality for human physiology, um, do not have simply a rhetorical role. Instead, they became um, an irreplaceable condition for the very thinkability and communicability of these two disciplines. Um, and uh, an essential moment for the development of what Esposito calls the immunological paradigm is uh, the 16th century shift from the Galenic humoral theory to the idea of contamination by exogenous and, uh, agents. And uh, according to Esposito, this, sh this shift reflects uh, and at the same time provides a, a biological reduction of the uh, threat of invasions at the political level. Indeed, uh, uh, Esposito observes that while the traditional Galenic humoral theory was flanked and opposed by the theory that diseases communicate through um, the um, contamination by um, infectious agents, at the same time in political treatises as well, the attention shifted from the overall, overall state of health of the body politic to uh, preventive pro prophylactic measures to keep it safe from, from the infiltration of allogenous elements. And so um, he um, observes that the greater the vulnerability of the body politics must have appeared, the more ur uh, urgent uh, the need became to hermetically seal the orifices that had opened up in its frontiers. And um, so uh, what Esposito calls the immunological paradigm of modern biopolitics develops simultaneously in political and medical treatises on the basis of a new dialectical way to conceive the disease, not only as a negative threat, but also as an occasion to reinforce the immunological system of the social and physical body. Uh, so in both medicine and politics, the idea spreads that the only way to protect the body is on the one hand to hermetically close it, uh, and on the other hand to incorporate part of what threatens it, uh, therefore dialectically absorbing the, the threat, so dialectically absorbing, absorbing the very negation of life, And um, so Esposito's brilliant intuition is that in, in a biopolitical regime in which uh, the political body and the biological body have a substantial literal relation, the body becomes the liminal zone where the immunological intention of politics is carried out. So my work develops Esposito's intuition behind the borders of medical knowledge, exploring uh, not the medical treatment of the body, but its construction as an aesthetical object. So in the 18th century, precisely in the moment in which, according to Esposito, the immunological character of modern biopolitics is taking shape, in uh, German um, thinkers such as Baumgarten, the Schlegel brothers, Kant, Herder, and Lessing, uh, these thinkers establish the domain of aesthetics as an autonomous discipline. And one of the most intrinsic and innovative components of this new discipline is precisely the concept of uh, the disgusting. 
the, the very concept of disgust, uh, of disgust becomes an object of theoretical attention only in the context of 18th century German aesthetics. And this fact is not contingent. Uh, indeed, the correlation between the concept of the disgusting and the foundation of aesthetics is deep and uh, essential. In 18th century aesthetics, the disgusting constitutes the limit of the judgment of taste and the limit of aesthetic representability. So in a sense, clarifying what must remain excluded from the domain of the beautiful, that is the disgusting, um, is precisely what allows to illuminate the proper object of the beautiful. So we begin to see how the relationship between the beautiful and the disgusting presents a structural similarity with the monological relationship between body and disease in Esposito's uh, philosophy. Esposito writes that although logically speaking, the physiological determination of the body uh, precedes its pathology, in point of fact, it derives its meaning from the layout of the pathological condition. What is healthy is only defined through contrast by the decision about what is disease. Likewise, as this quote from um, Menningau's monography on the disgusting describes, the notion of beauty is derived by sub subtraction from what must be avoided in the arts, that is on the basis of the decision about what is disgusting. And this is particularly evident in the construction of the ideal beautiful body. Indeed, in the aesthetic writings of the 18th century, disgusting zones and disgusting moments uh, become the strategic entry points of the construction of the beautiful body. Namely, the positive requirements of the aesthetically pleasing body are at the same time prescription for the avoidance of disgust. So my thesis is that in 18th century aesthetics attempt to construct the beautiful body through the subtraction of any potential locus of disgust, Uh, we can notice that what Esposito calls an immunological paradigm is at work. Um, indeed, if we analyze the 18th century requirements for the perfect body, we see how the scrupulous avoidance of what is disgusting creates something conceptually very similar to Esposito's idea of the Munai's political body. As Winkelmann writes, um, the perfect body of the Greek statues show us a skin um, that is not out but smoothly drawn over healthy flesh. Uh, the skin never projects as on our real physical bodies, uh, certain small wrinkles separately from the flesh. Uh, in the perfect work, there is more unity of the world stru structure, a, noble, uh, a, a nobler union of the parts, a richer measure of fullness. And uh, um, so the main feature, as these quotes um, show, uh, the main feature of the beautiful body is non-interruption. Every peak, wart, wrinkle, and fold, as well as every angle and corner is meticulously erased from the non-interrupted surface of the beautiful body. So as the humanized body, the aesthetized, aestheticized body owes its perfection to the clarity of its boundaries, to the unambiguity of its outline. And more importantly, the perfect body owes its perfection to the safety of its borders. Um, indeed, the elimination of uh, any bodily place that might evoke disgust uh, overlaps with the elimination of any place of potential contagion. All body orif orifices are tightly regulated and rendered invisible. First, the lips of the beautiful body are tight or at most slightly smiling. Open mouths belong exclusively to satires or founts. Uh, that means grotesque creatures that get dangerously close to the, to the, to the disgusting. And the aesthetic fixation with the closure of orifices is represented at, the, at its best uh, by the debate around the lacoon, the, the guy behind me, uh, in which uh, Winkelmann, uh, Lessing, Goethe, and many others debated whether um, the um, Homeric character, the lacoon, represented in this uh, famous statue, uh, was or wasn't screaming uh, while killed by a snake, by snakes. Um, so the debate is very complex, but let's say that Lessing, who dedicated the book to the topic, directly connects the uh, closed lips of the screaming lacoon to the topic of the disgusting. He writes that the demands of beauty could not be reconciled with the pain in all its disfiguring violence, so the master had to reduce it. He had to soften the scream because screaming betrays, um, not because screaming betrays an ignoble soul, but because it distorts the face in a disgusting manner. And he says simply, imagine Lacun, Lacun's mouth forced wide open and then judge. So in painting, the wide open mouth um, becomes a mere spot and in sculpture, a mere cavity with the most disagreeable effect in the world. 
and uh, the same meticulous fixation with the elimination of cavities and bodily openings can be found in the description of the ideal nose. So we read here that the Greek profile, that is the attribute of a style of beauty, consists of a nearly straight or slightly depressed line. And what is interesting to notice is that this depressed line is not in itself beautiful. That such a profile represents a source of beauty. Um, that such a profile represents a, a source of beauty is proved by its opposite. So, oops, sorry. Um, so, um, this uh, depressed line is not beautiful in itself, rather it is a form of prophylaxis, again, it's disgusting opposite, that is an overly prominent nose with protruding and large nostrils. And the same treatment undergo the ears, in which a whole series of complex modifications of the anatomy of the ear are aimed at minimizing the ear opening. So um, all body, uh, in conclusion, all body uh, openings in the ideal body are suppressed with a met meticulosity that reveals a fixation and a deeper distress. The perfect body is a, a, an hermetical container artificially held and perfectly immunized. The aestheticized body, in other words, is the, the realization of the obsession and reverie of biopolitics. It is a completely civilized and hygienized body in which every form of contamination and every bodily function is erased, producing a perfectly hermeting and empty surface. And this perfect surface, um, paradoxically, in its representing the maximal expression of human beauty is strangely inhuman, almost monstrous. The perfect body is to such an extent protected from the threat of the disgusting and therefore the, the threat of death itself, that it becomes a body in which every possibility of life is radically negated. So the attempt to eradicate from the perfect body the phantom of the corpse, that is the disgusting reversal of the uh, perfect body, transforms the perfect body into an embalmed body. Uh, therefore, ho however, a dead body. And in this paradoxical reversal of the human into the inhuman, of the body in the dead body, um, is expressed the intrinsic paradoxicality of the immunological paradigm and the intrinsic parado paradoxicality of biopolitics uh, more in general, namely its uh, uh, ne necropolitical tendency. So what the construction of the beautiful, disgusting body shows is that the more death is excluded from life, the more through this exclusion, death pervades every aspect and folding of life. So in the foundation of aesthetics, we find um, the necropolitical tendency of the metaphor, of the very metaphor of the political body. The metaphor, what, uh, the metaphor of the political body leads to an organism that is so tenaciously kept alive and pro protected from external corruptions to suffocate in it um, every trace of life. Wonderful. Thank you, Nora, so much. Wonderful. Okay, so we will now pass to our final panelist for uh, this panel, uh, Alex Taylor. So Alex is a fourth year PhD candidate in French literature at UW-Madison. Uh, his current research focuses on sound and music in French Baroque literature and in the 17th century French novel. In the past, he has produced work on the films of the French New Wave and French science fiction. And with that, I will pass it to Alex. All right, thank you. I'm just trying to share my PowerPoint here. All right, you see that there? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the presentation I'm gonna share with you today, um, which I've entitled uh, Perversion and Inversion in Francois Truffaut's Fahrenheit 451 is a reworking of a section of a research project I completed uh, several years ago on the subject of science fiction in the films of the post-French New Wave. Um, there are a couple reasons it occurred to me to kind of dust this off, um, dust off this particular essay for this conference on the theme of censorship and obscenity. The first is maybe obvious if you are familiar with the source material um, uh, of the same name. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the first reason is maybe obvious if you're familiar with the source material of Francois Truffaut's 1965 film, American author Ray Bradbury's 1953 science fiction novel of the same name. Bradbury's novel is a dystopia and a social satire 
whose main character Guy Montag is a fireman living in a distant future America in which reading has been banned and firemen, rather than putting out fires, track down books and burn them. While the novel's edifying subject matter and accessible language have made it a mainstay of middle and high school English curriculums since its publication, Fahrenheit has been the target of unauthorized bothersations and efforts by parents to ban and censor the book for obscene language and mature themes. Um, the second reason relates more specifically to Truffaut's film, uh, which encountered what might be called a sort of critical censorship aimed not at the film's content, as was the case with the novel, um, but at its form and style. Um, perhaps the most common criticism of the film from critics at home and abroad, um, meaning in France and um, abroad, uh, was its obvious and uh, poorly assim assimilated stylistic homage to the films of, of Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, news of the film's problematic production led several contemporary critics and more recent film journalists and scholars to speculate that Truffaut's stylistic quotation of Hitchcock was in reality less an homage than a crutch for the auteur who was overwhelmed by the task of directing his first and last high profile big budget English language film. Truffaut himself, always a prolific commentator of his own work, acknowledges in the introduction to his seminal series of interviews with the famed British director, both the influence of Hitchcock's style on Fahrenheit 451 and what he perceived as being the lackluster results. Um, what I would like to do today is not necessarily to rehabilitate um, Fahrenheit's reputation, but to analyze this charge of slavish quotation um, with greater care than contemporary critics who first levied it, and that a discouraged um, and frustrated Truffaut would later echo in his writing. I'll attempt to make the case that Fahrenheit 451 is in fact a careful and critical satire actually of Hitchcock's cinema rather than a simple homage or an acritical quotation through an analysis of passages of Truffaut's film that allude to typically Hitchcockian stylistic or narrative elements while also perverting them in some significant way. Um, my choice of the, of the verb pervert requires a bit of explanation here before we move on to look at the film in detail. Um, uh, it has two main meanings as I plan to use it and uh, two meanings which Raymond Bloor um, outlines in his famous essay on Hitchcock's psycho entitled Psychosis, Neurosis and Perversion. Uh, the first is general and not necessarily sexual in nature. It refers to a willful change into what is abnormal or unnatural. In the case of Psycho, uh, Bloor qualifies the film's structure as perverted because it uses narrative and filmic codes to set the spectator up to believe that Marion Crane's theft and her relationship problems are the central dilemma of the film. Um, that the film is supposed to see through to its re resolution. However, the traditionally stru structured with Crane's shocking murder in the shower at the Bates Motel. So the film structure is thus perverted relative to the traditional three act film structure that would have seen those conflicts developed in the first act through to their uh, resolution. Um, the second definition is of uh, sexual nature. Someone who is perverted seeks um, or obtains sexual gratification through some means other than the act of sex. Voyeurism and fetishism are two common perversions that Hitchcock's cinema explores and exploits with great brio. Um, as it relates to Hitchcock, the question of perversion is central to the film's kind of first degree satirical dimension. Um, in an interview with the defunct film journal Cinema, um, Truffaut said the following of the social relevance of Bradbury's novel and of his film adaptation. In our society, books are not burned by Hitler or by the Inquisition. They're made useless, stifled by images, by sounds, by objects. And intellectuals, authentic, honest persons are like Jews. He who has ideas in a civilization of things is damned. He who thinks is a heretic, something different, an enemy. He's a man to eliminate along with all of his books. In the world of Fahrenheit 451, both the novel and the film, which exaggerates to satirical effect 
modern bourgeois consumer society's alleged aversion to intellectual activities such as reading. Um, reading or the desire to read is thus a perversion and readers are the perverts. Um, this, is a, this of course represents an inversion of Alfred Hitchcock's universe, which is all but satirical. Hitchcock, in fact, exploits the spectator's prejudices, aversions, and fears to manipulate them and create suspense and instability. Truffaut's stylistic quotations of Hitchcock in Fahrenheit represent, in fact, a dynamic repurposing um, um, an inversion, a perversion of techniques meant to harness rather than to question dominant ideology. Before looking at how Truffaut perverts Hitchcockian cinematic conventions um, or specific ones, let's look first at um, what is in fact explicitly Hitchcockian in Fahrenheit 451. Um, in an interview with Le Monde in 1966, Truffaut characterizes Hitchcock's influence on Fahrenheit in the following way. I tried to be realistic in the script and dreamlike in the shooting by creating each scene, even the normal ones, um, an imbalance, an, ease, an uneasiness, an instability of which Hitchcock is the master and of which he has taught us the secret. Um, and specifically in this series of interviews that he was actually conducting concurrently with the production of Fahrenheit 451 with Alfred Hitchcock. Um, the techniques he uses to create this instability are indeed straight out of the master's toolkit. He hired Bernard Herrmann, who worked with Hitchcock on Psycho, North by Northwest, and Vertigo to compose the neurotic driving music for his film. He constructs scenes by highlighting the exchange or the casting of ambiguous charged gazes, something uh, Truffaut identifies as uh, uh, a characteristic trait of Hitchcock cinema. Um, he uses doubling to create uncanny echoes between objects and characters. He uses a dream sequence modeled on the one in Vertigo um, to suggest the progression of firefighter Montag's neurosis. One additional and perhaps more subtle method Truffaut uses to create this Hitchcockian unbalance um, is by casting doubt on the lead character Montag's sexuality. Truffaut never acknowledges this explicitly in interviews, but this is another classic device Hitchcock uses to create tension in his own films and one that is central to Fahrenheit's um, social satirical dimension. So let's look um, at the question of doubling that I um, evoked earlier. Um, the most obvious, obvious instance of this um, that also has a number of close Hitchcocking corollaries is the doubling of the heteronormative romantic relationship at the film's center. Uh, Guy Montag, played by Oscar Werner, um, is rather unhappily married to Linda Montag, a housewife brainwashed by bad TV and pills of various sorts, played by Julie Christie. Um, returning home from the fire station on the retro, well, on the normal, uh, normal futuristic monorail, he encounters Clarice, uh, a dissident involved in the illegal circulation of books who ultimately by um, in reality, Judy and hire the wife of Scotty's client murder plot. Are you there, Alex? Yeah, I'm sorry. How long was I out? <laughs> I would say go back maybe a minute. Okay. All right. I'm really sorry. You were speaking of Clarice. Okay. Yeah, just like a minute, like the last paragraph or so. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm flustered. Okay. 
Um, no worries. <laughs> um, so Guy Montag is rather uh, unhappily married to Linda Montag, um, a housewife brainwashed by bad TV and pills played by Julie Christie. Returning home to the fire station on the monorail, he encounters Clarice, a dissident involved in the illegal circulation of books who ultimately facilitates his path to enlightenment and escape to freedom, also played by Julie Christie in my previous slide, which is now not changing, okay. Um, compare this with Hitchcock's Vertigo, which follows a schema that is clearly a reference for Truffaut and that his film inverts. Detective Scotty, is played by James Stewart. He falls in love with Madeline, played by Kim Novak. In reality, Madeline is Judy, a single woman hired to impersonate the wife of Scotty's client as part of a murder plot. Scotty falls for Judy after Madeline's staged death, not realizing until the end of the film that Judy and Madeline are in fact the same person and that he's been duped into aiding the cover up of the murder of the client's real wife. So there's a lot to digest there, but the important thing is that whereas Madeline and Judy's identities converge over the course of, film, of the film because they are in fact the same person, Clarice and Linda diverge um, and represent two kind of different ideological choices. Whereas Scotty is duped, Scotty of Vertigo is duped uh, and drawn in in spite of himself out of involuntary rage and passion to produce the film's tragic conclusion in which Judy meets Madeline's fate. Montag, his decision to leave his wife and follow Clarice to live among the dissident readers is a conscious intellectual decision made of his own free will. In Vertigo, the distinction between Madeline and Judy exists only in Scotty's mind because they're actually the same person. In Fahrenheit, the distinction between Clarice and Linda is real and never called into, the que into question. The casting of Julie Christie in the roles of both Clarice and Linda both alludes to the false doubling of Madeline and Judy in Vertigo and positions Fahrenheit as Vertigo's ideological opposite by inverting that relationship and implicitly denouncing Vertigo's kind of anti-humanistic worldview. Um, this is a perversion of Hitchcock in the general sense of the term perversion. Another doubling engages the second sexualized sense of the term perversion that I evoked earlier. Um, <clears throat> in addition to Linda and Clarice, the firehouse captain played by uh, Cyril Cusack, colorfully described by George Bluestone in a contemporary review of Fahrenheit and Film Quarterly as an ambiguous homoerotic arsonist, enters into the fray to form an ambiguous third couple with Montag. The captain, in addition to his slightly effeminate manner and excessively keen interest in Montag's advancement through the firehouse ranks, may have another perversion in addition to the implicit sexual one. The captain is at once apparently a true believer in the mission of the fire department and a true connoisseur of literature, perhaps a reformed reader who displays his vast knowledge of world literature and philosophy to Montag upon the discovery of house race. Alex, you're cutting out again. Do you just want to wait 10 seconds, maybe? Or maybe you could stop share the, the screen. Maybe it's better. I'm sorry, this is really frustrating. Um, I'll put up here. No worries. If you wanna, uh, just for time, if you wanna kind of conclude in the next couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, 
Take a deep breath. You're good. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, both films, uh, in fact, recommend um, their villains. Uh, kink, we'll say, um, but uh, Hitchcock's. Uh, I'm sorry. This is like. Uh, um, I'm not really sure where I cut out. So I'll just come to my conclusion. Um, so there's more to say here that I could not fit into my presentation today, unfortunately, um, particularly in relation to a key scene in the film in which Montag pretends to avoid capture, an inversion and an allusion to many real fainting spells throughout Hitchcock's work. Um, but it, even taken at face value, um, the prospect of a Hitchcockian Truffaut film is paradoxical and tantalizing in equal measures. Hitchcock, one of the six directors studying in Andre Bazan's collection of essays published under the title The Cinema of Cruelty, is a film author whose body of work spanning four decades and 50 films casts men and women as neurotic, psychotics, and perverts struggling and failing to satisfy or to liberate themselves from their thwarted unconscious desires. Truffaut, on the other hand, is the most humanistic of the new wave directors whose films demonstrate an unfailing naive faith in the capacity of humans to improve their self, themselves, to learn from experience and to find innocent pleasure in non-normative romantic or platonic relationships. We can only conclude that this perception of the intertextual Hitchcockian elements of Fahrenheit as poorly assimilated or parasitic was less a product of real analysis than perhaps of an ideological allegiance to the romantic conception of the film author whose work is valuable to the extent that it faithfully reflects their unique vision and sensibilities rather than those of a maître à penser. All right, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Alex. Sorry you had some technical difficulties. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, and so I guess we'll pass on to the Q&A. So we'll start with what's in the chat. Um, if you think of more questions as we're going through people's answers, please feel free to type them in there or raise your hand. Um, so for Jean Paolo, uh, we'll go with uh, Professor Rumble's question. So Jean Paolo in his gospel Pasolini. Maggie. Yes. If you prefer, I've already read the questions. Okay, then go uh, right ahead. <laughs> no, no, you know, we don't have so many times. So I guess I can summarize the three questions in just one answer. What do you think? Oh, I, okay, I'll, I'll do my best to try to answer to uh, the three questions. And thanks, Professor Rumble, Luke, and uh, Hillary for those interesting questions. So I should say that in the original version of the Gospel of Matthew, the figures of Christ is uh, interpreted from uh, a realistic perspective of what? Of an existential humani humanism derived directly from Marx, which uh, exalts the mystery of man and makes visible the reality that determines his life. A sort of, a, a kind of like and pagan sacredness and uh, with the inevitable uh, epilogue of death, for sure and has an archetype of a singular anthropocentric uh, ideal, the Judeo-Christian incarnated by God, uh, incarnated by Christ, uh, is, uh, as Peter says in the very same Gospel of Matthew, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. And he manifests in front of men to talk about himself, revealing uh, to men the presence of a sacred reality hidden and at the same time unknown, that actually lives within itself. Uh, we should say the homo absconditus. And uh, as I said, a sort of like and pagan exegesis of what is from, uh, for example, for Isaiah and for Pascal, the Deus absconditus. And uh, he reveals himself in a sort of primordial figure. And uh, as Matthew say, uh, you are the light of the world, which aims to the possible ultimate significance of human nature, utilize, utilizing the, the identity uh, of his own being 
as a unity who splits into two opposite fronts. From one side, the conscious, and uh, on the other side, the unconscious fears, reason and reality, in other words. And uh, it is, uh, well, we should say he is like uh, uh, something bounded in the Hellenic tradition of, uh, of the Apollonian Dionysia conception of Nietzsche, for example, that expresses the liberation and the autonomy uh, of a will uh, that is always about to become manifest and given the circumstances inside, inside the, the boundaries of the tragical universe. So to resume, Pasolini's Christ recognizes uh, the answers of man. In what in, in the definite boundaries of loneliness of time and destiny and secondly he is the expression of the conflict that derives from the paradoxical dimension that moves that move in search of their own individual and collective existence we, we should say suffering joy pain pleasure distress and happiness so uh, i guess that uh, the risk for Pasolini, so getting close to the question of uh, Professor Rumble, he, at the time was actually to disappoint everyone. Uh, but I think the most important aspect is what he felt making this disappointment. I guess he was wounded, especially by the Marxist uh, consideration of his movie, to disappoint a ma uh, The followers of the Marxist ideology, especially in 1964, was very painful. It was a kind of sort of sacrifice of, of Pasolini ideology. So I hope I answered to the, book, to the questions. I did my best. Thank you, Gianpaolo. Um, I guess we'll go to Nora next. Um, so you have a couple of questions in the chat, one from Professor Ian Vila and one from Sarah Fangler, both in relation to the sublime. Um, I'm not sure if you got a chance to read through the questions, but. Yes, mm -hmm. um, yes, I read them. Um, can I can I yes. answer? Go right okay. ahead. <laughs> um, so concerning the category of the sublime. Um, so this is a very interesting point because uh, surely the sublime and the disgusting have in common the fact that they um, represent a defeating of imagination and reason. In both cases, like imagination and reason cannot work anymore. They cannot uh, perform their, their function anymore. But um, the interesting difference is that while the sublime, as, as you perfectly know, like uh, transcend this, uh, this obstacle and this impossibility and leads to a higher form of pleasure, uh, like by, by definition, the disgusting is what um, prevents um, every form of pleasure. Uh, so in a sense, they are uh, the same impasse of imagination and reason because in front of a disgusting object, according to the um, classical authors, not, uh, not in my opinion, uh, in front of a disgusting object, like the um, sensible um, perception is so overwhelming that uh, imagination and reason just cannot uh, work. Um, but, um, and this is more like the Kantian side of the interpretation of the sublime. Uh, but for example, in Lessing, in the, in the Laocon, um, precisely, we find the idea that um, somehow the disgusting can contribute to the sublime. So the, when the disgusting is like functional to something else, something higher, it can be like a, a um, an element propedeutic to the creation of the sublime. And this is a tension that is uh, uh, very strong in, uh, in German aesthetics and that is not resolved. Um, so how the disgusting can be like the radical opposite of the beautiful and the sublime and at the same time like a part of it. And this is uh, um, again the sense of uh, the analogy with the immunological paradigm. So the idea that this, uh, um, this negation of the beautiful and the sublime must uh, be somehow incorporated in the, blue, in the beautiful and the sublime to make them um, perfect. So thank you, it was, it's a very uh, interesting point. And um, the second question about uh, um, the fact that according to Kant, the, the, the beautiful and the sublime uh, normally refer to nature and not to arts uh, or the body. So um, obviously like my argument works only if we consider the, the, the human body or anyway, like 
uh, human forms of representation because of the political uh, counterpart in it. Uh, but an, in, an interesting point, I think, in this respect is the fact that, you know, for um, for Kant, but also for Mendelssohn, for example, the idea is of uh, illusion, of uh, aesthetical illusion, is that something um, we experience something as if it was nature, even if we know that is um, some an artifact. And so, at the opposite, we experience nature as if it was produced by uh, a creature, as if it was produced by a sort of human endeavor. And um, what is interesting is that the disgusting. Um, completely undermines this relationship between art and nature. In a sense, the disgusting is always nature, even when it's represented, even when it is in a painting or in the lacon, or what, in the lacon there is not this disgusting. Um, but in any case, the disgusting always brings back to a dimension of nature um, because it's always a threat that is so real to um, produce a short circuit of our senses and uh, presents itself as natural. And I think this is maybe, um, the most interesting aspect in relation to, to the question about nature. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we're at the end of the time slot that was allotted for our panel. And so I wanna make sure that everyone has time uh, for a break. So Martina just put the links to the next two panels in the chat. Panel three is on obscene in the streets and in the sheets and panel four is obscenity revisited. So hope to see you in one of those panels next. Um, thank you.